The longest campaign in Canada's modern history came to an end last night. Joining us now for more on what happened and why, we welcome Supriya Devetti, consultant at Crestview Strategy, Tim Powers, vice chairman, Summa Strategies, Kathleen Monk, head of Kathleen Monk Consulting, Andre Demies, co-host of the Canada Land Commons podcast, and Jonathan Kay, editor of The Walrus and columnist for The National Post. Good to have you all here for our post-mortem on what the heck happened last night. Uh, get comfortable, because we're just going to go through some of the numbers here and in case people went to bed too early last night. If you would, please, Sheldon. Here we go. Seats in the House of Commons last time compared to this time. You see what happened to the Conservatives. From majority government to official opposition, the NDP took a big beating last night. The Liberals will bring 150 new MPs to Parliament Hill when the House reconvenes. 150. That's unprecedented. The Greens got elected with one, come back with one. One of their floor crossers, they were at two, lost. And the BQ, not official status, not official party status, but up significantly, uh, but still short of where they wanted to be, no independence. Uh, a bigger house, as you can see as well, 30 more seats this time compared to last time. How about uh, the total vote? Uh, the Conservatives off almost 10 points, the NDP off more than 10 points, the Liberals up almost 20 points from last time. Greens down a bit, block up a bit, and turnout up a lot. A lot of people taking heart from that. Uh, the Ontario turnout as well, uh, mirroring the national average, almost 69%. Well done, people. And how about uh, Ontario's situation? 80 Liberals this time, 33 Conservatives, 8 New Democrats, no Greens, and in the 416, it's all red. All of it. Okay, Tim, in your view, what were Canadians saying last night? Bye-bye, Stephen Harper. How about that, Steve? Um, I, I think it was a change election on a number of different fronts. You talked about the number of new Liberal MPs. There are over 200 new MPs. That's uh, almost a th two thirds of the parliament. That's a generational change that's happening there across the board. There was a change current that was out there that Justin Trudeau successfully was able to manifest for his advantage. He was able to take away from the NDP a good degree of support, and the Conservatives couldn't grow their support. Why couldn't they grow their support? Um, I think Canadians got a little sick and tired of being punched and decided to punch back. I think the tone of the Conservative government at the end uh, was what sank them in large measure. You can only be punched in the face so often before you throw one back at somebody else. We'll follow up on that tone uh, comment in a second. Supriya, what would you add to that about what Canadians were saying last night? Um, I mean, the one thing I would add is that the campaign that the Conservatives ran was also a little bit disjointed in terms of the, what they were putting as their message. So at first it was, we thought it was going to be about leadership, then about the economy, and then halfway through we started talking about values, you know, and then they did that weird prop thing with the price is right kind of gimmicky stuff. It just seemed to be all over the place to me, and I think what Canadians were really saying, you know, and I don't discount the change vote at all whatsoever, but I, I think that does a little bit of a discredit to the kind of campaign that the Liberals ran, which was, you know, very positive. Um, and they reached over 11 million Canadians in the, in the past year in door knocking. The last five days, they got to a million doors. Um, that matters. And I realize that's the one common, you know, cliche to say in all campaigns. But, you know, door knocking really does make a difference. Kathleen. The change um, vote did really matter. I mean, poll after poll showed that 70% uh, wanted Harper out. I think, um, you know, to Mr. Mulcair's credit, he did, you know, he did very poorly, obviously, last night. He can't be happy with the result. Mm -hmm. New Democrats aren't happy uh, with the result at all. But I think that one thing that um, he could claim some credit for is the fact that he did help to wear down Stephen Harper over the last number of years while he was in the House, uh, in the House of Commons and, and actually really exposed Harper's agenda. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Trudeau, uh, to his benefit, was the benefactor of, of Mr. Mulcair's work in many ways. And, and Supriya's right. The Liberals ran a fantastic campaign, um, and, uh, and, and they should be credited for that. It's often the case in politics that he who opens the door isn't necessarily the person who gets to walk through it, right? Yeah, or he who wields you know, the knife doesn't get to wear the crown, right? There you That's go. Famous saying, yeah. Andre. Um, one thing that I really noticed was that uh, as far as the NDP goes, I mean, they, they had uh, a huge sweep in the last election in uh, Quebec and, and in Toronto as well. And, um, you know, we had a lot of, uh, when we did the, uh, the live podcast last night, we had a lot of uh, NDP supporters, but unfortunately inside of the 416, they just got swept right out. And I think that speaks to a bit of a crisis in leadership. 
Um, you can't claim to be the party of progressive values and then not claim progressive values during your campaign. I think we saw a huge rightward tack during the NDP campaign. We didn't hear much about poverty reduction. We didn't really hear much about child care. And I think, uh, you know, those messages just didn't resonate with progressive voters. A lot of them were left off the map. Some people just didn't even bother to show up and vote. We, we're, we've got some maps up right now which show that the NDP got wiped out in the city of Toronto, the 416, the capital city of Ontario. If you add the provincial seat situation to this map as well. I guess that takes you to about 47 ridings. 45 of them are liberal right now. Yeah. Two new Democrats, zero conservatives, federally or provincially, in the 416. Unprecedented. Jonathan, what else would you add to that? You know, speaking of the 416 uh, and some of the ads that ran, I remember for me a, a defining moment of this campaign in terms of the positives and negatives. I remember I was watching the baseball game over the weekend and this, uh, this conservative ad came and played over and over and over. And it was this dark shot ad, this, this sort of cranky narrator showing, at first not Justin Trudeau, but Kathleen Wynne, mm -hmm. and telling me how horrible she is and what an awful person. And look, here's Justin Trudeau touching her. <laughs> and there's just no bit, just this. And you know what? I didn't vote for Kathleen Wynne. I don't, you know, I take it or leave it. But she's my premier. And like, what is up with this n relentlessly negative ad just telling me how horrible my premier is and look how horrible is this guy for being friends with? And I remember being kind of sickened by it. And then they showed it over and over. And then uh, juxtaposed with that was the Trudeau ad, which, I mean, was fairly vapid. I mean, it was just sort of like feel-goodery. But at least it was positive. At least it had a positive feel-good message. And from an emotional point of view, I remember thinking, like, I I've just absolutely had enough with this relentless negativity after 78 days of this toxic stuff about how everybody else is weak and stupid except for Stephen Harper. It just, that's why they lost. If, and you mentioned, Jason Kenney mentioned it, tone. You just used the word tone. Why did either the Prime Minister or the people around him not seem to understand that people had had it with that tone? Well, I, I think the challenge Stephen Harper had and other leaders have this. When they have political success doing a certain thing, so being doctrinaire, being disciplined, having a language that manifests itself around that, it's very hard for them to change. One of them, back to the word change, one of the weaknesses of the conservative campaign wasn't that there wasn't a willingness to embrace new ideas, new approaches, and, and an assumption, and a very false one, about the weakness of their opponents. I mean, what was this long campaign designed to do? It achieved one of the things it was designed to do, which was stall NDP momentum. When the race started, the NDP were ahead. They wanted to take some of the oxygen out of that. They hoped, over the tenor of the 11 weeks, that Mr. Trudeau would stumble and fall. Uh, that obviously didn't happen. And the other quick lesson with this, um, expectations. They thought Mr. Trudeau would not be able to perform in an, an admirable enough way that he'd win the support of Canadians. He more than did that, and the NDP were guilty of that as well. I mean, Mr. Mulcair talking about wiping the floor with Mr. Trudeau. The lessons here are pretty simple, Steve, when it comes to how you set up and manage a campaign. And, and the, the final thing I would say in answering your question is, you know, the Conservatives are guilty, as the Liberals were before, of assuming the arrogance of power and not being able to disassociate themselves from it and not being able to hear what everybody in this room and across the country has heard. Hmm. You helped uh, Justin Trudeau write his autobiography, so I want to put this to you. Tim is right. The campaign was as long as it was in the hopes, partially, mm -hmm. that uh, Trudeau would put his foot in his mouth or stumble or do something like that. Instead, he turned out to be far more energetic, far more disciplined, far more... Um, far better than anybody mm -hmm. thought he would be. Why do you think that you know him better than anybody at this table? Why do you think that was? Part of it is I just think his relentless physical energy mm -hmm. and um, he's a guy who just, um, <laughs> he's like the living embodiment of some kind of Tony Robbins seminar. Like, I mean, just, <laughs> no, but he's just, and I, well, I mean, but I don't mean... What Jonathan, the, where were you last week? That could have been a conservative <laughs> commercial. Yeah. By the way, it just you know, for legal purposes, without the creepy Tony Robbins aspect. I just mean, like, the, the... No, but he, I mean, he is a relentlessly upbeat guy with a, a ton of energy, mm -hmm. and, a, and I think physical energy goes into it. A lot of times you see people on the campaign trail, they're haggard, they're grumpy. Part of it is just being worn down by 16-hour days, mm -hmm. and I don't think that that was a factor for Trudeau. He, he loves physical challenges, and to go 78 days without being grumpy, without having a major gap, that's unbelievable. I mean, I can't go through a single day without being grumpy and unpleasant. <laughs> and this guy went through 78 days. I mean, that, that's actually an amazing thing. It, like, it's, the, the conservatives thought they were going to 
get this guy out of the game after four innings and get five or six runs off him. Instead, it was essentially like a three-hit complete game uh, with an amazing box score. And I think people will be studying this campaign for decades and they'll say, what did he get right? It was positive. He didn't make mistakes. He was underestimated. And he had uh, a government that, in this case, was unpopular and that shot itself in the foot with negative messaging. Kathleen, I need to understand better this knee cub business. And to that end, Tom Mulcair took a principled position against the knee cub situation, against mm -hmm. Harper's position on the knee mm -hmm. cub. In other words, people ought to be free to wear whatever the heck they want when they're being sworn in, blah, blah, blah. Justin Trudeau essentially had the same position. Mm -hmm. Mulcair got cream for it in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Trudeau won more seats for the Liberals in Quebec than anybody, I guess, since his dad. Is that right? More than his father. Since, since Constitution, I think. Since like 1982, I read that stat uh, on Twitter liberals, or something. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For Liberals, yeah. Took more no, 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 yeah, for, yeah. for, for, for mm -hmm. the Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. Can someone explain that to me? Well, listen, uh, it is actually the story of Quebec will be one of the interesting things to analyze in the days to come. Uh, the Conservatives picked up, uh, I believe, seven seats. Yeah. Um, the Bloc, another 10. Um, you add those together and you bring them back to the Democrats, and the Democrats could have had a more respectable caucus. The Democrats only left uh, Quebec last night with 16 seats. Mm -hmm. So some of um, some new uh, MPs, but mainly the, the core of the 2011 crop, if you will. Um, I think it goes back to what we just discussed, that sometimes uh, Mr. Mulcair was seen to be even, even in Saskatchewan, people on the doorstep were telling us, why are you bringing up the NACAP, which is not, as all of us know who are following the campaign closely, the case. In fact, it was Mr. Harper who put forth the idea and then even raised it in subsequent interviews, with, for instance, the public service notion that people shouldn't even be wearing it then. Um, but you're right. Uh, Mr. Mulcair uh, did wear that and felt the effect. I think that the party should have been better prepared um, for the question of identity politics. Uh, it's not new. It wasn't just introduced in 2015. It's been around Quebec uh, for a number of years now. So that is really disappointing. But that said, you know, um, for New Democrats, if I can, there were still 16 new MPs that were elected last night, largely a half dozen of them in BC, in British Columbia. So uh, we have three new seats in Saskatchewan. And if I can, um, for the sake of my party, otherwise I might lose my membership, <laughs> uh, I think that I, I would point out that... Um, you know, the message was bad. Uh, we didn't learn the lessons from Ignatieff in, in, in 2011, where he campaigned against Harper, but he didn't have a positive offering. And I would say that Mulcair really fell short on that. But I disagree with my colleague on the issue of actual policy and progressive politics. Mr. Mulcair and the NDP's platform that they put forward in terms of $15 minimum wage, raising seniors out of poverty, reinvesting in health care is actually in pharmacare is one of the most progressive uh, platforms that has ever been for, put forth in Canadian well, history. But you went for the balanced budget as well and you weren't prepared Correct. to go after the 1% the way Trudeau did. But Trudor there's did. nothing progressive about going into deficits. Just to, you know, mm. uh, progressives okay, don't enough. see going into deficit as part of their, you know. Yeah, I just want to, I yeah. want to quibble with a few things there about Quebec, just be, it being my home province and all, and John as well, I'll call you out. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it seemed weird to me from the onset that Malcare uh, was was introducing measures of austerity when when right now with the Couillard government in Quebec it's not exactly wildly popular you're, you're he's running a $15 a day daycare that's great but Quebec already has it so when you have 59 of your seats in in the province and you're not appealing to that province uh, I think that's where you know they really went wrong and not necessarily just the niqab issue I, and i think it was you know I, chantal Hebert actually pointed this out in a toronto star column just saying that it, his his misfortunes were kind of ramping up before mm -hmm. the the identity politics stuff and the value stuff really came front and center mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts about why in in, in quebec it sort of didn't work for Mulcair, but it did work for Trudeau, and they had the same position on this knee cub business. I actually wanted to uh, make almost the same point that Supriya made, which was that uh, when you when you are putting forth a policy that already exists inside of Quebec, um, and when you're not actually the the thing that it really bothered me about um, Mulcair sort of wearing this issue was that you didn't see him actually like sor forcefully in support of people wearing an ECOP. For almost every candidate that wasn't Stephen Harper, it was, oh, you know, this is just this is a non-issue and people should be allowed to wear whatever they want. What I really would have liked to see is somebody just step forward boldly and say, you know what, people can wear whatever they want and we welcome it as Canadians because that's who we are as a, as a culture and as a society. We welcome everybody's religion, everybody's color and so forth. Um, one thing I really did not like also um, was that when we talk about balanced budgets, deficits, and so forth, you say that it's not a progressive policy to run deficits, but I don't think that that really falls under progressive, conservative, or anything, really. It's just a matter of numbers. 
And I think if we look at the actual numbers that Canada has to offer, like we are going to be running into deficits if we actually want to fund programs that we enjoy. If we want to fund social programs, if we want to fund uh, daycare subsidies, if we want to be able to fund health care and infrastructure spending, then yeah, we are going to end up running into deficits. We just have to be realistic about that. John? I Oh, sorry. I, I just, I, I, by the way, I want to give um, Mulcair his due. I, Mulcair was in a really tough spot. The larger point here is that when you have a party founded on I ideology, in this case it's a progressive ideology, uh, and you also have a party with a strong regional base that has a lot of political idiosyncrasies, uh, there is, it's inherently unstable. Because mm -hmm. whenever the ideology conflicts with the regional sensibilities, you're going to get uh, this, you know, a tempest, and this is exactly what happened with the NECAB, and what made it worse for Mulcair, and this is, this goes back to Jack Layton's days and the Sherbrooke Declaration, is this ridiculous decision the NDP made to embrace the concept of 50% plus one as the, the, the baseline for separation. Do you think that was a factor yep. last night? I, I think, it was, and it was a huge factor for this reason, that once people got the sense, okay, the NDP is the nominally federalist party that's going to give us anything we want, including this foundational thing about when we can separate, then we are going to be disappointed when they don't keep giving us what we want. And so when Mulcair was hesitant to say, well, you know, I'm with you on the kneecap, Trudeau, on the other hand, got a free pass because Trudeau can raise his hands and say, hey, liberal, party of the charter, not but, my decision. You know, mm -hmm. That's their brand. I, I don't want to diminish the, the good discussion on, on policy, God forbid. It, it is important, <laughs> but that was probably more policy discussion that actually substantively happened on the campaign trail. I think you can simplify this another way, too, to look at what happened. Mulcair and Harper have similar dispositions and similar approaches. They're strong, they look a little curmudgeonly, uh, they look like they know what they're doing. That worked very well for Mr. Mulcair in the House of Commons. He won accolades for it. He was seen as the progressive pugilist who could take down Stephen Harper. Justin Trudeau embodied his message. He embodied that energy that John was talking about, his, his messaging, his tone, his ability to perform uh, in a way so different from the other two, was able to channel that desire for change. Um, Andre was talking about change. We did some polling uh, with Abacus, and we found that people wanted ambitious change. Justin Trudeau was a far better embodiment of ambitious change than Tom Mulcair was, and people mm -hmm. cottoned on to that, I think. And the other thing is that the NDP actually ran, uh, from the onset, their messaging was very much like Olivia Chow's municipal campaign, which was, we're the only ones yeah. that can beat Stephen Harper. Except the one thing that's wrong with that is that clearly they weren't. And the second you start to dip in the polls, voters look at that and go, oh, well, if we're an, an anybody but conservative vote, why am I voting for you guys if you can't actually deliver on that change? Whereas the liberals started, you know, were reaching out to voters and were having an, an interactive conversation about why they're the best party to beat Stephen Harper, because they were going to deliver on these progressive values. You can also they should say have the had same that board. positive throw, but actually, if I was giving them advice, I would have said they should have started that messaging earlier sure. in the campaign. Yeah. Actually, yeah. if you divide the campaign up into periods, yeah. as in hockey, I would say the problem is actually the whole first period of this election, um, which was from August till about like Labor Day, um, New Democrats largely gave uh, Justin Trudeau a, a free ride. And actually, perhaps at that point, by letting him get up off the mat, uh, doing so well in that McLean's debate, which he certainly did, and then continuing his numbers just, and, and the Liberals knew that. Liberal strategists will tell you that they knew they had to deliver in that first month and that's where they, they front-loaded some of their ad spend and, and that was a smart tactic on their behalf. That was good strategy. There, there, as you look at Justin Trudeau, however, what is he, 43? 43. 43. Okay, so like Brian Mulroney. 44. I think it's 43. 43? I feel like that good when I'm 43. Oh, 44. Well, okay. 44, 44 on Christmas. On Christmas Day, he's 44. Brian Mulroney was 44 when he became Prime Minister. I think Stephen Harper was 46. Six. Six. Okay. N nobody accused Mulroney or Harper of being, you know, too childlike for the job. We hear this about Justin Trudeau, and of course, so much of the campaign was not ready yet, way too young, way too inexperienced. Why didn't that stick? Uh, look, um, I think it stuck when Justin Trudeau gave some air of credence to it, when he made stupid jokes yeah. about ISIS or CF-18. I mean, that was, that was the moment that a lot of liberals, die-harders, die were like, oh, this is, this is done, we're, this is going to be a disaster. Uh, when he started joking about things as serious as war and peace, uh, there was a Quebec talk show that he went on. He made a dumb joke about uh, uh, Russia's intervention in Ukraine compared right. to Cause hockey. Because they, they lost yeah. in hockey. And he did a couple yeah. of things like that. And, you know, by this time I was done with the book and, you know, I wished him well. And I remember thinking, oh, yeah, well, there go the royalties because this guy is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, uh, John thinks about John. Yeah. Uh, and, no, but I thought that, you know, around now he'd be looking for a job as head of an NGO in Montreal or something. But what, what that, what's amazing is he had the capacity for self-knowledge 
and to change. And he said, you know what? I'm going to stop making stupid jokes about serious subjects, and I'm going to stay on message. But, and yet, somehow, he didn't lose the sense of spontaneity. So when someone jumped out at him at a gay pride parade in British Columbia, he actually embraced the woman and didn't do some sort of standoff or Stephen Harper type thing. Mm. Um, so he retained that aspect of his personal demeanor. He was we out taking selfies at, uh, you know, in the subway in Montreal at uh, whatever, 7, yeah, 8 o'clock this he morning. He took the selfie, but then he didn't make a joke about Ukraine. Like, I mean, that's, it's, right. it's, it's that kind of line that he was able to obey. And you know what? Maybe it's mm -hmm. Gerald Butts. Maybe it's uh, his uh, number one advisor mm -hmm. was able to, uh, to keep him in that delicate zone between pure spontaneity and being overly programmed like mm -hmm. Harper. But I also think that, that presents a very good contrast. When you have Harper yeah. talking about, I also like televised entertainment and I enjoy <laughs> iced cream, um, and you have a, a, you know, a, a, a young guy out, out there who's Take, you know, what, what you said, uh, the woman jumping at him at the at Pride Parade or, or out taking selfies or just being very jovial and natural in front of a crowd, I think presents a stark contrast. Also with Melchior, uh, you said he was a little bit subdued or what have you, or they kept him on a sh short leash, lackluster debate performances. I think this all, you know, goes into a social media reality where people are constantly tweeting out every, you know, bit of the campaign and it, and it, it penetrated. Tim, let me ask about the Prime Minister's concession speech last night, which, which was pretty classy and pretty gracious, all things considered. I mean, he was, uh, you know, at the top of a pyramid experiencing a, an historic collapse last night, which was, well, I shouldn't say historic collapse. He's got more than two seats. It's not 1993. Right, yeah. but, but he didn't get his four in a row. It is the tradition when leaders lose under those circumstances to say, I'm stepping down as your leader. I've asked the president of the party to call a leadership convention. He didn't do any of that. How come? Well, as uh, Kathleen's colleague uh, Jamie pointed out last night, Jamie Watt, uh, he uh, did what conservatives normally do. He doesn't talk about personal matters, Steve. Uh, <laughs> he had the uh, issue uh, released. I don't know. I honestly don't know. And I think that explains in part, and maybe Jonathan should make his next book, Stephen Harper, and spend some time with Stephen Harper and <laughs> try and have that psychological divide that he's working through now. But uh, he knows I'm teasing him. Um, but uh, that's not Stephen Harper. And that's always, he's always had this challenge of getting from <laughs> wooden to, well, yeah, 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 yeah I know you, you're joking when you yeah. say it, but, but that's been part of his connection problem. Um, it was his success for a very long time because if Justin has been able to tap into authenticity and part of that authenticity is energy and celebrity and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, Harper's political success was the opposite and I think for him his success is now his failure. He wasn't able to transform to the degree he needed to to build comfort with others and that was reflected in that speech. Andre, do you, th I mean some of the stuff I've read today suggests that he didn't want to give his enemies the satisfaction of seeing him resign in public. Now, does this that is somebody resonate? somebody who hasn't been comfortable giving journalists uh, information that they requested freely. This is somebody who has held information very close to his chest, uh, somebody who killed the long-form census. Like, Stephen Harper just has a bizarre war on information. So I think <laughs> to be talking about the internal, uh, uh, I guess, turmoil inside of his party or inside of his leadership, that's just not who Stephen Harper is as a, as a person or a human being. I think it also speaks to a certain kind of arrogance. Um, and I, I know this is a little bit off topic, but you notice that in, in elections, uh, starting back in 1993, um, each, each party that ha captured a majority was able to get a smaller and smaller and smaller percentage of the vote. And that's pretty much how you won in Canadian politics, is you get a huge majority and then you like, deal with a smaller percentage of the electorate. I think that Stephen Harper was okay with getting a smaller percentage of the electorate as long as other people don't win. So from my point of view, watching that speech last night, it's he probably knew he wasn't going to win, but it's not okay that he loses, like everybody else has to lose as well. That's how it came across hmm. to me. What does Tom Mulcair do now? Well, I, I don't think we'll hear to today or the next few days, certainly. Um, I think he'll take his time. You know, New Democrats and like other parties don't really have a history of eating our leaders if they fail. Tommy Douglas lost and ma maintained David Lewis, others. Um, so I think that um, certainly he'll take some time to reflect. It's got to be incredibly disappointing, mm -hmm. um, losing people like Megan Leslie, Jack Harris, Paul Dewar in Ontario, all Peggy the Toronto Nash, MPs, Peggy Andrew Nash, Cash. Andrew Cash, who's a good friend of mine. I mean, these are really devastating losses. That said, Tracy Ramsey in Essex, that's a pickup in, uh, in the southwest of Ontario mm -hmm. and, and look to new blood there. Anybody got any advice for Tom Mulcair? Can he, I mean, uh, on Take the one... Yeah. You could use a nap, I think. It's a good I meal. Go home, I support that nap yeah. call, yeah. 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 
Does mm -hmm. he have to leave? I, th I think he leaves. Uh, obviously, Harper's left. I think Elizabeth May leaves. I mean, this has become a joke at the Elizabeth May party. Uh, and Elizabeth May's main campaign plank is including Elizabeth May in debates. Uh, no, but it's, it's, no, it's, no, but no one, I mean, I, by the way, she's done some good things in Parliament. Uh, her oratory often is good, but I mean, her, her party is a complete joke. Like, it is, the, its entire raison d'etre is to elect her to the Green Party's one seat. And if the Green Party is going to mean anything in Canada, it needs a new leader, too. We, so we need at least three new leaders. Does it need a new leader, or does it need to merge with an existing party? I mean, is there... You know I think the bigger, the bigger question there is why do we need the NDP anymore? I mean, the NDP, sorry, sorry. That's what they were well, about well, the last election. Like I mean, like every election cycle, like, why do well, we need this party? Why, why, why do we actually need progressive values in Canada whatsoever? <laughs> no, but we have Justin Trudeau taxing the 1%. That's not progressive. Uh, you know, Justin Trudeau building $60 billion worth of infrastructure. If I could just say, on of the voter for a moment, uh, there were 3.5 million Canadians that voted for the Democratic Party. So I don't think we should be so easy to dismiss them in terms of we have their second best seat showing in the history of the party. Okay, so so take into point, but still at around 20% in the polls, that's still a fifth of the electorate, I think the fact, Jonathan, that you can't the dismiss. The fact that pretty much like half the NDP support evaporated overnight, uh, well, in the space of six weeks or eight weeks, basically shows that there are a lot of voters out there who more or less see the NDP and liberals as kind of similar ideo yeah. ideologically. I'm just kind of are, just what, not what, half, But right? why, why, yeah. why do you need two parties? To my mind, it's, it used to be a union movement, and the NDP has in its constitution the union mandate, but the union movement has withered in Canada, but and the NDP has no reason. Not though. But, that's but the way sorry, block, that's, block that's, that's not what happened yesterday, respectfully. I think, in the end, it wasn't about whether the NDP had a particular position or not, uh, or Mr. Trudeau had a particular position or not. Mr. Trudeau looked like the vehicle he was driving was going to win. What was the win for a large percentage of Canadians? It was driving over Stephen Harper. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very... That seems unnecessarily violent. But <laughs> I, I know, well, you're using all these baseball metaphors. They're too genteel for me, but, but <laughs> that is what happened. And I think when we dive into this, Kathleen's right. The NDP had their second best showing. There is some resilience there, and there's resilience because they are, I think, in my view, slightly different than the I'm Liberals. Guy. I remember the era of, of Ed Broadbent, uh, and I remember, you know, there really was this ideological gulf. But when I was watching the debate during the election campaign, and I see Trudeau calling out Mulcair for not taxing the one percent more, then I'm That's thinking, why, why so does this it's party true. exist? The question I about not taxing the rich will be one that I think the party will consider. But also, there's choices about, you know, increasing taxes on corporations, which, you know. Mulcair was able to do, and it's the progressive answer to funding those very priorities that we discussed earlier, like childcare, like healthcare. Uh, those investments, those choices, like pharmacare, uh, were only being represented, really, by New Democrats. And I think by 3.5 million voters, almost 20% of the electorate, that, that speaks to, you know, New Democrats only won 44 seats, but we came second in 84 across the country. And it's a regionally balanced caucus, with the exception of Atlantic Canada, yeah. which I admit is a total disaster. Yeah, white yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. well, Here's one thing that I, I think is important to remember. So 32 odd percent of Canadian voters did not show up last night. Yeah. And it's not because people are just completely disinterested or uh, apathetic or whatever we want to say. We always say that it's young voters and people who just are too lazy to show up. There's actually a lot of people who just simply don't show up out of principle. And I mm -hmm. think that a lot of them simply did not recognize who the NDP even was by the end of this election. But I, I think it also speaks to not respecting your base, right? And I'm going to go back to this, this Quebec point is that when you're so the conservatives, their main mistake was that all they did was try and appeal to that base. You saw that with the Ford stuff. You saw that with the values, you know, dog whistle mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. And with the NDP, they were trying to appeal. They wanted to be everything for everybody. And, and that mm -hmm. just can't happen. Um, that's a, a little bit what the, the NDP provincially did here in Ontario. And we saw that win tacked to their, to their left and outflanked them. And that's essentially what Justin Trudeau did with, with federally. There may be a tendency, though, I think there is, the day after the election to over-interpret a lot of what <laughs> happened the day before. <laughs> And I wonder, if you look at the percentage of the total vote that Stephen Harper got in 2011, and you look at the percentage of the total vote that Justin Trudeau got last night, mm -hmm. it's almost identical. I mean, it's within a tenth of a percent of each other. So... So that's why first past the post, maybe, is, which is a system that over-rewards some well, and under-rewards others, This right? is where I'm going. The, we have a first past the post system, which clearly uh, over-rewarded the party that came first this time, as it did last time. Justin Trudeau campaigned during this campaign by saying this is the last election if we win that we're going to have with first past the post we're going to bring in something different 
Does anybody really think that's going to happen? Yeah, I do. I you, think so. You do? Yeah. I was actually trying to explain you, to a friend of mine. I was trying to explain to a friend of mine uh, who she's here from France. She's not a citizen yet, so she couldn't vote. But she was she was asking me like, okay, so I'm not sure how the system works. Not because she couldn't comprehend it. She just couldn't understand how Canada has been a country this long with the system that we have. And she says, well, who actually invented the system? And I said. Uh, actually a bunch of drunk Scotsmen. I can't really explain <laughs> it better than that. Um, I, I think the idea that um, our first past the poll system, you're right, completely over awards uh, one particular party, but it also shuts out a whole lot of values. So we might take the liberal win as saying, well, you know what, things like universal child care and all that stuff is not really that important anyway. We want to go with what the liberal party says. But I think that calling this a referendum on Stephen Harper or calling this a referendum on change is oversimplifying it. I think if we saw a proportional type of system, then we would be bringing a lot more voices, people who think that their voices either simply cannot be heard uh, or it's just futile to go out and vote because we already know who's going to win anyway. I, I welcome that enthusiasm and I hope you're right and maybe it's because I, my office sits so close to Langevin Bloc, which is the office of the Prime Minister, so maybe the opiates they put in that office <laughs> weighed out into the air. I think there's a challenge of structuralism here. When you go in, when you achieve power, what starts to happen is you make decisions based on how you maintain power. One of the challenges that Mr. Trudeau is going to have with this big caucus that Brian Mulroney had and others who have big caucuses is they're all going to want to be elected the way they were previously elected. They're going to have entrenched interest. I think part of that challenge for Mr. Trudeau is to say, look, we won because we promised to be different, but the structure may prevent that. And it puts us in this very interesting place. If expectations were low for Justin Trudeau, they're now oh so very high. Mm -hmm. So he now has to develop, and, and, and John would have good insight on that, a new skill set to manage these high expectations. He faces a similar challenge to Mr. Obama. And it's a challenge, believe me, the other leaders wish they have today, which is, I have promised to do so many substantive things, talking about commissions of inquiries, uh, work for seniors, and the like. How can I possibly deliver on them all, and what do I need to do to do that? So his skill set is going to be flipped around now, and it's going to be fascinating to watch. Because you're right, there are a lot of people who do want the first past the post system to die. Let me follow up with Supriya on that. Scott Reed, your pal Scott Reed, wrote a terrific piece for the Auto Citizen today, in which the punchline essentially is, you, you've got to do what you said you were going to do. And all of these things that make yep. you different from Stephen Harper, now that you're in, you really have to do them. You can't you know, not tell people where cabinet meetings are happening and refuse to do ins and outs and all that kind of stuff. You've got to be different. But I think we've, we're already seeing that. He's, he's holding a, a, a media availability. Uh, he, well, he held one, rather. Yeah. Um, so that's a stark change in, in what we've seen over the last nine years. Um, and the state and, actually talks to us. Wow, that's an amazing yeah, exa change. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But and, Harper did that when he started, just to be fair. I mean, <laughs> Harper had a premier's meeting. It was one of the first things that he did. He had regular news conferences. Paul Martin started that way. I hope... You're right, and they yeah. all start that way. Tim, I'm generally right. I don't know. I will. <laughs> I'm told that, and I won't go against yeah. you. But that, I mean, that's a, that's a fair thing to demand for him for the entire four years, is it not? You promised to do this. Oh, you better not get sucked into the Ottawa vortex like so many of them do. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, and he'd, he'd be letting down an entire contingent, an entire generation of voters that, that voted for, that voted him in. And, and I think he knows that, and I think his advisors know that. And everybody in the liberal camp is really, you know, cognizant of that fact and is going to, you know, hit the ground running. Okay, let's do, yeah, should we run this clip? Let's run the clip, and then I'm going to come back and... Since we're TVO, we're going to talk a bit about O. But in the meantime, let's run the clip. Go ahead, Sheldon. Have faith in your fellow citizens, my friends. They are kind and generous. They are open-minded and optimistic. And they know in their heart of hearts that a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. My friends, we beat fear with hope. We beat cynicism with hard work. We beat negative, divisive politics with a positive vision that brings Canadians together. Uh, I think one of the lines that really struck me last night, and it, he certainly used it before, uh, the Conservatives are not our enemies, they're our neighbors. This is a guy who's obviously trying not to just appeal to a narrow band, but rather create a bigger tent. My question is, John, to you first. We're into a new, well, it's not so new anymore, but the atmosphere in Ottawa has been pretty toxic over the last little while. So what happens when established toxic environment meets new guy who really wants to kind of appeal to the better angels and everybody? What happens when that clash 
happens. I think he has the moral advantage, and not just because of what a toxic place Ottawa has become. I think Canadians have spent the last couple of years watching their, their TVs and seeing how awful things have gotten in the United States, where Republicans and Democrats <laughs> can't even pass a budget. They, they despise each other so much. Um, and you have conspiracy theories going uh, both ways. Uh, and you saw some of that in the election. Um, you know, I, the Jewish community, to take one example, where you had people in the Jewish community who were attacking each other. You know, if, if you don't vote for Harper, you're, you're selling out Israel and, um, and, and really bitter, bitter stuff, where it literally was your neighbor uh, wouldn't talk to you because you were a bad Jew or a bad Zionist. I do know Thornhill stayed conservative last night. Peter yeah, well, one of, one, uh, although interesting, well, we, we can go through the, uh, the uh, York Center when Mark liberal. Adler, for yes, instance, yeah, Mark he Adler did lost. not, he'll never get his million dollar shot. Uh, <laughs> you know, a, if, you, if you don't you understand that I'm reference, sorry. check Google. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, too soon. Look, I, I think it, it is real, and I don't think he would have said that if he didn't know that people watching were like, yeah, there's some guy at work who won't talk to you because you're a Harper fanatic or you're a Trudeau fanatic or there's someone in your family. Or, you know, we just had, uh, you know, or, or a Thanksgiving celebration, for instance, where a Thanksgiving celebration is ruined because someone goes on a rant about politics. Uh, I, I have seen social relationships and family relationships uh, get harmed by this sort of thing. So he was talking to millions of Canadians there. Do you think, Kathleen, that when the toxic old atmosphere meets the let's appeal to the angels, the better angels in us all, do you think the angels can win? Oh, I'm hopeful. I'm always on the side of angels. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I got to think that all progressives, whether they're New Democrats or whether they're Green, um, can support many of the things that the Liberal government has campaigned on, like taxing the rich and like investing into our uh, social <laughs> services. So I'm hopeful. But what, what is interesting about this campaign is, you know, the Conservatives um, in the lead up in the last few days were talking about these shy Conservatives mm -hmm. that may not have been reflected in the polls. Well, it turns out they were really shy and they were hiding under a rock. <laughs> and, and actually, the real the real question is, what about this other extinct breed of, of progressive conservatives that used to be a bastion of uh, where uh, Tim Hale's from, the, the East? You know, they basically are non-existent Well, maybe now. they come back to the party now and that so Harper's I think that's gone. What, I think, well, I think, that's, I think that Trudeau was trying to court those well, people and McKay's smartly. Right, yeah. Peter <laughs> McKay's writing is a great example of that. Where, you yeah. know, Peter just, McKay's conservative central Nova writing went liberal. So red, Huge. red Tories are now just red. Yeah, they're just they're now just yeah. red. Yeah. Although it did do that in '93, and it did come back. Uh, but there, there were two conservative parties in '93, weren't there? Uh, pardon? Weren't there two conservative parties in '93? Yes, there which were. Help split the right-wing vote. No, there's a lot of work. There's a, absolutely yeah. there's a lot of work conservatives need to do to bring people back in. But they do, and this will be part of the Harper legacy. And I know that's not what this program is about at the mm -hmm. moment. But he does leave the party in a position, though he's lost with 99 seats. Um, yeah, it's not a wipeout. It's by not a wipeout, yeah. and there's a way to build from there. The challenge will be to change the model. This model worked for Stephen Harper. Whoever's next needs to change the model. I think that um, it, 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 here's the thing. I would have liked to see this become a route, almost like '93, where the Conservatives mm -hmm. become a rump party, because now the, the Conservatives need to decide what kind of party they are. Mm -hmm. Are they the fiscal Conservative Party that the PCs hail from, or are they? I guess more of like a, a, a race-based nativist party, which is where the Reform Party pretty much came from. And I think uh, we saw a whole lot of that nativism play out in this particular election, and we overwhelmingly rejected that. I think if you actually saw a progressive model come back to conservatism, where we say, look, we're all Canadian, we appreciate everybody's culture, we don't call anybody terrorists, but here's what we uh, consider as far as, the econ as, as far as the economy to be good sense. Um, I think that there's a really good opening for, uh, for progressive people to come back into the party and, and attempt to take that over. Um, I don't think that a rejection of Stephen Harper should have, it wasn't as overwhelming as it should have been. Um, if Harper's politics were not okay with Canadians, they would be the third place party well, right now. Look, fair enough. Look at the map of Alberta. I mean, there were still plenty of conservatives who won in Alberta last night and by huge, and Saskatchewan by big margins. And yes, the Liberals did make a breakthrough in the province of Alberta in a way they hadn't since 1968. And also in Saskatchewan. And you don't in Saskatchewan? Forget. Three. Here's the map. <laughs> Here's the map. Look, uh, I mean, you, you, I think I can see green. You can. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to see. Orange, sorry, orange. This is a wide shot, Look, so you can't see it too well. Mississippi Churchill River. Look at that big swath of orange <laughs> in the top. It's great. But there's, I think there's, there's three little tiny patches of red in Alberta. In uh, I guess one in Edmonton and two in Calgary. Uh, you can't see here. But but this map, in a strange way, looks a lot like Pierre Trudeau's map, where much of the rest of the country was sort of red and a little bit of orange, but the West was very, certainly, Al, you know, Alberta was still very, very blue. Okay, let's leave that behind for a second. I want to know about Kathleen Wynne. I'd like to know, Sapria, to you first. Kathleen Wynne barnstormed for 
the incoming prime minister in a way that no Ontario premier has in more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. You got to go back to Bill Davis stumping this hard for Brian Mulroney and, and even Joe Clark and Robert Stanfield before him. My question is, does Justin Trudeau owe Kathleen Wynne anything? <laughs> I mean, look, I think there's a good partnership there, and I think Ontario is obviously a very important province when it came to things like funding infrastructure in, in, in Toronto. Uh, ab absolutely, but that was part of his, you know, he campaigned on that. Um, I don't know if there's any, like, I don't think there's anything insidious about it. I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, working with a, a, a provincial premier who has like-minded values and, 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 and a platform as you did. So I think it's more of them working together than rather, you know, quid pro quo, I owe you. Well, he's, it's not just Kathleen Wynne. I mean, in all of Atlantic Canada, where they dominate, which they're going to have the hardest time managing expectations, uh, Premier Gallant in New Brunswick worked mm -hmm. closely with Mr. Trudeau, Premier uh, McNeil in Nova Scotia, Premier McLaughlin, and they're going to be a new P. Liberal yeah. Premier in Newfoundland uh, who has also been very close. So it's going to be very hard once the halo is off all of this to meet the expectations. That's not saying he can't do it, but there are going to be so many from so many different groups, unless we have expanded our Bank of Canada by significant <laughs> measure and raided Fort Knox, it's going to be pretty goddamn tough. <laughs> it's good. Is that a technical term? It is a technical is a, okay. term from the East. <laughs> from the East. Uh, Kathleen Wynne held a news conference this morning mm -hmm. at which she said, I don't have a transactional relationship with the incoming Prime Minister. I'm not going to be going to Ottawa with a checklist saying you got to do no. this, you got to do that, you got to do that. Well, she said. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that kind of what Ontarians expect? Well, we don't need a checklist because it's all in the public realm, right? Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about that is that she said very specifically that she would abandon her provincial pension plan if a Liberal government, because they would bring it in federally. So I guess the, the talk about the expectation game that, that Tim mentioned earlier, I mean, it is incumbent upon this strong, progressive, majority liberal government to deliver on pensions for Canadians, to increase the CPP, to deliver on that promise. And hopefully progressives will hold not only Mr. Trudeau, but Ms. Wynne to that promise. Because what you know, what's frustrating from a New Democrat point of view once in a while is that they do campaign to the left and govern to the right. Mm -hmm. And so the job now is really to actually deliver mm -hmm. on many of those progressive policies that Canadians rallied around in this election, and pensions is surely one of them. What would your expectation I, I, I hearken back to when Kathleen Wynne became Premier of Ontario in 2013 and the Prime Minister at the time declined to take a meeting with her for more than a year. Clearly, this incoming Prime Minister and this Premier have a better relationship than that from the get-go. What should our expectations be with that improved relationship? First of all, and we haven't spoken about this, but I, I, I do think it's telling that Trudeau and Wynne went all in with each other. Mm -hmm. And then two days before the election, Stephen Harper comes to Toronto and meets with Sad Oboe Sound, the Fords, <laughs> which, was, yeah, it was just Thank like, no, <laughs> it was like this horrifying grace note on this crappy yep. campaign, uh, which we won't talk about. I think when I, I happen to go door to door with Christopher Freeland as part of my reporting, and University Roast, University Roast, wow, it's off the top of your head, mm -hmm. that's impressive. She, I mean, her big thing is economics, and she go door to door, and she didn't have to say we're selling, you know, we're going to get ours for Ontario. She didn't have to play the regionalist card. She played the infrastructure card. Mm -hmm. Said we're we're investing tens of billions of dollars in infrastructure. What does Toronto need? What do outlying areas need? They need highways. They need roads. They need mass transit. That's not an Ontario issue. It's an infrastructure issue. Mm -hmm. So I think both Trudeau and Wynne have an opportunity to play this in a way that doesn't arouse crass regionalism. It's about infrastructure. But people like you on yeah. your Canada Land Commons podcast are going to be looking for the first cracks in that relationship between Wynne and Trudeau when she wants something and he doesn't give it to her for whatever reason. And people and the press is going to descend, and they're going to aha, you see, not yeah. so cooperative I after all. I don't necessarily say that. I just think that it's just common sense that you would want a strong Ontario. I think that uh, the MNT between uh, Stephen Harper and Kathleen Wynne for the or for, to to the Ontario Liberals for the last while um, has been to the detriment of the entire country. We've lost manufacturing jobs. We've lost natural resources jobs. Um, and essentially we've formed Canada into almost a petrol state. I think that by investing in things like tech and medicine, by investing in infrastructure in Ontario, you make a stronger Canada. I don't understand 
why any Ontario Premier wouldn't expect the Prime Minister to make heavy investments in Ontario. It's but, but I think petty. it's... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, it's also incredibly petty for the Prime Minister to not have met with, with Premier Wynne for so long, just because of personal, you know, differences or, or what have you. But fair, fair comment on the relationship side, but I, I think if you look at the state of the Ontario economy, it's hard to dismiss that as simply a relationship issue. I'm not suggesting you are, but many yeah, do. Sure. And that's not well, the right have, way to look. But, no but look at... We dollars coming our way, and you... you like, it's, it's incredibly but difficult for people simply to get to work. And but the federal government can do something about that and chooses not to, then why the heck? But you 20 also, seconds well, left. You Tim, also you have it. to assume responsibility of your own house financially. There have been a number of decisions well documented on this program that the provincial government has made. They shouldn't just expect to be bailed out by the feds, too. We're going to give Mr. Powers the last word on this program. Thanks, everybody, for convening at our little table here for a postmortem on what I think was the most astonishing election of our lifetime. I think it was. Anyways, good to have you all here at TVO tonight. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.